So taking a look at this slide, I put up a quote that I think is a very good example as to how to understand what women's role, Eritrean women's role in the movement for liberation. And it's remember the women who have been martyred fighting. Remember the women who gave birth while fleeing from their homes and those women who have been born and have grown up fighting for the liberation of our country. We are the EPLF as much as anyone. We fight for our rights as women, but the world outside our bodies, outside our identity as women, belong to us too. And so this is Maaza, who is a cadre of the Women's Mass Organization in Eritrea, the National Union of Eritrean Women. And I think it's extremely telling what she's saying, which is not only is it, there's more to a woman than just her gender and gender roles. And the Eritrean revolution really is indicative of that. Stage is historical context. So understanding our struggle really starts from US support and Soviet support of the Ethiopian uh, regime of the time. In the interest of the superpowers, because Eritrea is located in the Horn of Africa, is geopolitical interest, they forcefully federated Eritrea with Ethiopia. This most of us do know. They federated it and supported it with both political acumen and military aid. So federating Eritrea with Ethiopia really yoked Eritrea to a semi-feudal system to Ethiopian colonialism. And this is where the revolution really begins. So the Ethiopian military, you have to understand that Ethiopia could not have waged this war without the support of the West. And it was really something that was waged against the civilian population above all else. So you have women, children in villages, schools, you know, in the outskirts of the city, within the city, that really were victims of um, repression, torture, killings, hangings, genocide as well. And I have here the term terra nullius, which is a Latin term, which really means nobody's land, which is a concept that really sets the framework in terms of what was really being perpetuated or perpetrated against Eritreans. So I know these images are pretty vivid, and I chose these images because I think they are a very important example as to a lot of the suffering that many of us endured. And without these images, it's very difficult for us to comprehend what some of these challenges were at the time. So bombing targets, right? So as I mentioned before, the civilians were really the ones that suffered the most. Napalm and cluster bombs were, were tactics used on civilians in order to, um, excuse me, the international community made sure that they condemned it on the use of civilians. Women and children were essentially the main targets and victims and witnesses of genocides, annihilation of villages, there are countless. Some of them that I will name are on Hajar, Ona, um, you know, even within Asmara, they were not immune to some of these traumatic experiences. Even in the 1970s, uh, Asmara went through a series, uh, a three-day mayhem of sustaining killings throughout that city. All mostly amongst women, children, and of course our male brothers went through it too. But today is really a focus about what were the struggles that women were facing? What were the struggles that they were really um, experiencing? Now, one of the things about the, unique about this war was the use of aid as a strategic or systematic um, tool to create excessive circumstances for the people. So it was during the time Eritrea was going through, in the Horn of Africa actually, was going through a lot of drought and famine, through locusts, lack of water, lack of rainfall, and the aid that the international community was attempting to send into not only Ethiopia but into Eritrea was prevented from being, um, from being distributed to the society. So it is during this, like I mentioned before, um, that women took an active role and utilized their agency to start participating in many aspects, many sectors of the Eritrean revolution. Has anybody ever taken a bio class or a science class? 
Yeah, so you've heard of Charles Darwin. That's somebody who consistently comes up. And Charles Darwin, he talks about survival of the fittest, this idea that the um, that a lot of people misconceive, which is that the strongest are usually the ones that survive. And it's not really about brute physical strength. It's about adaptability. Adapting to your extreme circumstances is really a true characterization or a true measurement of what a an organism or an entity is in its fittest form. And I believe that Eritrean women really represent that. They became catalysts of change in two concurrent struggles. One, like I mentioned, was for existence in the fight and the right to self-determination by becoming participants. A third of the EPLF military was comprised of Eritrean women. And the second concurrent struggle was challenging traditional ch gender norms, right, in order to obtain access to various sectors in our society. So in the 1950s, there was major political <coughs> upheaval from about 1952 to 1961 when Eritrea was being forcefully federated and annexed. And during that time, there was it culminated in something called the Group of Seven, which was a cell of seven people. They were increasingly organizing and coordinating in guerrilla activities in the lowlands. And although they women did not comprise the majority of this organization, they were there were some fundamental women who played a part. And some one of them is Gre Fesaham, who was a child of somebody named. Um, nicknamed Gandhi, and she acted as a political deputy to Walda Ab Walda Mariam. As many of us may know, Walda Ab Walda Mariam is a um, major political figure at the time, and she was definitely utilizing her political savvy to assist him in campaigning on behalf of Eritrea for it to be able to be an independent nation and for the rights of the people as um, determining their own um, future could be solidified. And part of the reason why I like the pictures, especially on the right, is it's kind of like a, a dichotomy between tra very traditional, customary looking women, and then their, um, their counterparts are on the top, the daughters, that have to adapt to their new circumstances. So still being able to maintain the connection to some positive aspects of tradition and custom while also transforming and being innovative about what their roles are going to be in their own society and in their own movement. So navigating new dynamics. So change is always difficult. Usually they say the path of least resistance is usually the one that we like to take as human beings. So whenever there is change, there's challenges that come about that. And adversity is meant to strengthen your faith, strengthen your capacity. And by navigating new dynamics, you can see that a lot of them were thriving and taking active roles in various as aspects of the movement. So you have building trenches during the um, trench warfare uh, tactics that were Eritrean freedom fighters were using. You have women operating tanks, and you have women getting into direct combat. Now, in the, in the United States, even there, there's, there's still a debate about can women really be able to enter into direct combat? If you follow that, um, you know that that's still something that continuously comes up, especially in a nation such as the US, which is developed. But with Eritrea, mind you, in the 50s, in the 60s, and the 70s, they were able to exemplify that at its core that their capacity is not something that should be questioned because they were able to exhibit their skill sets, their critical mindset, their power, their savvy in order to be active participants. They utilize their agency and that's the most important part about what came out from the revolution. So I mentioned the group of seven and so here is a, a picture of a few of them that, um, not everybody, but a few of them that were taking that role. And a lot of times, people don't realize that even in as early as the 50s, because sometimes a woman's, the women's story is not always told, and a lot of times, and we're working on it, historians tend to be males. Not saying that they deliberately um, do not 
tell their stories, but as women, I think that they have a better capacity to be able to reflect what their actual struggles were and what were some of the transitions that they had to make. And so even as early as the 50s, there were, people, there were women that were getting actively involved. So I mentioned earlier that a lot of women entered into direct combat, and a lot of that came with sacrifice. So just the anecdotes tend to be something that a lot of us walk away with. So I'll tell you a really, really short story about a woman named Lemlem Nebuchadnezzar, who with a group of her comrades, knowing that she's pregnant, but knew, knowing as well that her participation in assisting her comrades was crucial, she went into towards battle, pregnant, mind you. And she was wounded in that battle and lost consciousness during that time. And it wasn't until a little bit afterwards that her comrades found out that she was pregnant. Because had they known, they probably they would have made her stay, which is why she kept silent about it. Because she was thinking about the ultimate reason that she was participating, the ultimate reason why she had to be there with her comrades. And so it wasn't after, after she had the baby, luckily, she had the baby, she returned to combat again. She was injured and returned to combat again. And these, this is like a very, very small example of, of the many, many stories that probably we won't even get to hear in our lifetime, but a small example of the contributions and the sacrifice and the major risk that women were taking at that time. In addition to entering into combat, education was a crucial, crucial, crucial part of the political movement in Eritrea. We know that education is fundamental. So women were utilizing that to teach their fellow sisters. So sisterhood is something that um, really became solidified across the various nationalities, because as we know, Eritrea is diverse. Um, with different na nine nationalities. So her, um, the political education that was being utilized in order to make, sh make sure that women and, and their counterparts and their comrades were conscious and understood the reason why they're participating in this is very important to understand. So there was a, a another woman named Lemlem Tawalden. So hopefully, if I test you guys later, you'll remember some of these women because you're actively listening. Um, so there's a woman named there was a woman named Lemlem Tawalden who became a martyr eventually, and her story was told by someone named Wal Asra, her comrade, her sister in arms, her sister in spirit. And what she tells is that um, Lemlem was a political organizer. And when she was in an area called Irawara, she was surrounded by enemy Ethiopian combatants and wounded when they opened fire. Two remaining grenades. One, she threw at the combatants to try and injure them, to try and deter them. The other, she kept for herself to detonate, and what she did, detonate on herself because she understood the knowledge that she contained about the internal workings of the, or of the Eritrean organization needed to be kept with her, not to be revealed to combatants that could utilize it in whatever way possible. She threw it on herself, and it wasn't effective. So she was injured, badly injured. And, you know, her guts, her innards were revealed. But the combatants, the Ethiopian combatants, took her, took her wrapped her up, bandaged her up, because they weren't done with her yet, took her to Adi Tehizan, and were going to torture her for information that she contained. What did she do? She unbandaged herself, she ripped up the rest of her innards, and she martyred herself, understanding that knowledge is power. And whatever knowledge that she had, she needed to retain for herself to make sure that the revolution could continue. So other sectors of participation. So obtaining not only vocational skills, but very technical skills is extremely important. And so I have a few pictures up here. Um, probably many of you know Dr. Linus Gavrihiwat, who was a oral maxillofacial surgeon who went to Eastern Europe, became trained, highly trained in her medical field, in her surgical field, didn't choose to go anywhere to make money, because we all know surgeons make a lot of money, came back to Eritrea in, in the middle of the revolution, in the middle of all of the battles, was there 
conducting surgeries, not only for, for any trained freedom fighters, but also for her fellow brothers and sisters in the greater society of Eritrea. So providing a necessary service was something that she felt she could not absolve herself, absol absolve herself from. In addition to Dr. Lanish, you have, I have two um, foot doctors. So they may not have received as technical training as um, Dr. Lanish, but Khadija and Askaru were both foot doctors going to places in the society that were inaccessible, you know, roads were not as developed as they may be now. So inaccessible rural communities, ensuring that every aspect of the society was still being able to get the service that they needed at its at its core, such as health. Okay, and here I have a few pictures of um, uh, Dr. Linus conducting the oral surgeries. Now, because I don't have time, I'm not going to play the clip in, on the right, but she gets interviewed by, um, she gets interviewed and she speaks in English and she talks about the motivation that she had to come back and con continue her work in the middle of the mayhem that exists in war. Obtaining vocational skills and mechanical skills was something that was extremely important. And in order to improve their own lives, as well as the, as well as the lives of others, there's a sisterhood that's built around that. So women educating other women. Now, have you ever, if I have been in school for the longest, and um, <laughs> there was a time that I was allowed to go to a, um, up to Boston for a all girls math camp. And it was the first time that I was surrounded by all girls. And it was a very interesting experience to be with only females. There's something about being amongst, no offense to my brothers out there, but there's something about being amongst your, your own gender that feels very empowering. You're more likely to be critical. You're more likely to challenge, challenge others. You're more likely to receive challenge. Um, just the immense nurturing that exists amongst sisterhood is something that I think was truly reflected during the time of uh, the struggle for independence. If you look closely at the picture on the left, these are anatomy books written in Tigrinya. So, you know, knowing about your body is really something that enables you to also speak to another person about what is going on with their body, what are the pros and cons about making certain health decisions. So with female genital mutilation, utilizing women to be able to do the work to create a cultural shift, a, a, a social psychology shift in understanding that this custom is not the best for us is something that I think is really profound. And, I, and it has continued until this day. That work has continued. And then on the top right, um, in the little corner, that's actually a woman teaching her male comrades, which I thought, you know, I'm going to put that up here because I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> because to have the confidence to do that, even for me to be able to come up and talk right here, sometimes that's a little daunting. So I appreciate that for what it is. Now, I mentioned the technical and mechanical acumen that they were gaining. So a lot of times working with major mechanical equipment is not something that is associated with women's work. It's usually associated with male's work. But the fact that a lot of these women challenge themselves and challenge the norms that existed in order to achieve what they wanted to achieve and build a lot of these um, fix mechanical equipment, build equipment in order to provide, whether it be pharmaceuticals, because um, we know that at the time they were making malaria medications, so knowing how to do that. If you don't know, one of the great things about the struggle for independence was the resourcefulness that existed. You don't have money to continuously buy and export equipment. So what you have is what you get. So the limitations and resources did not stop a lot of these women. So they were able to be resourceful and fix whatever they needed to fix and send it back out there to con continue doing what it needed to. Now, enhancing farming skills. So a, a lot of um, Eritrean society is a pastoralist society. Agriculture is, farming is one of the main ways that they um, sustain themselves. And so in a way, it's, a, it's still a traditional 
a traditional traditional work, but enhancing it by learning more about animal sciences to help the cattle within the um, within the various communities or knowing how to deter locusts, which was a big thing that was destroying crops at the time, and working with their male brothers is a big deal. Because a lot of times women weren't looked at as, at the time as doing field work. They may have done it, but they may not have gotten credit for it either. So being able to see these images is really inspiring. Now, a lot of times um, in current conversations, there is... The idea that a woman can only have children and that is her purpose is something that some, it is meant to limit their um, capacity. But even within motherhood, there is, I find, there's a lot of power and inspiration within it. And so during the struggle for liberation, motherhood was still very important and it took a form. It took new forms. So on the left, you have freedom fighters, female freedom fighters that still had children. And so you know, still appreciating what bringing a new generation is about, imprinting a new mindset upon them because they know that they are the future, they are the promise, was still significant during that time. And furthermore, the other new forms of motherhood, we know that Eritrea was going through a lot of genocide, massacre, bombings, so on and so forth, as I have mentioned. So it produced a lot of orphans during that time. And Eritrean freedom fighters who were martyred at the time and had children, also those were orphans. But women became surrogates to other to other women's children. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So here you have some of the uh, children and orphans in a refugee camp, and they try to make a merry-go-round in a uh, bunker-style um, complex because, you know, having to shade themselves from that. So they made a merry-go-round for them to try and make sure that they still maintain their childhood. And then on the top right, you have um, still the, the education that I mentioned, the political education that they were making sure to expose a lot of the society. They made sure to, to expose the children to that too, the ones that they were surrogate, that they were surrogates for. And then on the, top, on the bottom right, which I think it's, I love that, is the shaving of the heads of a lot of kids. <laughs> so giving them um, haircuts, you know, becoming makeshift barbers for uh, health purposes. And then mobilizing civil society. Even um, the battle was also fought on the war fronts, but also civil society is another aspect that needed to be in, that women needed to get engaged in. And so you have... Oh, the middle picture is not there. Um, but it was women who were galvanized around workers' rights. And even today, we talk about workers' rights here and across the globe. So that was something that they were really galvanized around. And then on the right, you have the women taking a role in the voting process when the referendum came about. And then I really like this one because this is just... Oh, a woman in the mass, the National Union of Eritrean Women at the time, and she's speaking up in front of everybody and really engaging and vocalizing herself about her perspective. When referendum came about, which was um, a really great thing, it was really to legitimize Eritrea's independence for the international community. But to me, I think that we really legitimized our accomplishment on the battlefield. At the bottom of the of the picture, it says a popular vote that gave birth to a nation. But I don't think it's the popular vote that truly did that. Supreme love is really what did that. Love to me is sacrificing your own well-being for the sake of another person's well-being. You may know them and you may not know them as well. But sacrificing yourself for the betterment of others is something that is a gift that has no comparison. And to me, that is what truly solidified um, our independence, and women took a huge role in that. And the only thing that I have left to say is actually a quote by E.H. Carr, who was a historian in the 60s. And he said, this, the historian without his facts is rootless and futile. The facts without their historian are dead and meaningless. So to paraphrase, right? I could be a historian, but if I had 
Like, if I do not have the accurate information, then there's no reason why I should be doing that job, right? You need that factual information. But more importantly, factual information requires a storyteller. And as a person that came from that legacy of Eritrean womanhood and accomplishments, I understand that it is my responsibility and I have to be accountable in ensuring that their story becomes transmitted and the memories of their accomplishments and challenges continues to be something that propels me and other Eritrean women like my counterparts here forward. Thank you.